but in essence be harming society as a whole. It sends a message uh, not only to the kids but uh, to other people who are doing uh, these crimes that they can get away with it. The teens convicted of sexually assaulting students at St. Michael's College School won't have to spend any time in jail. Instead, the three will only have to serve two years probation each. Tonight, a former student at the college says the ruling sends the wrong message. Lorenda Redekop has more and a warning. Some of the details in this story may be disturbing. Probation and 30 hours of community service for three teens who pleaded guilty to both assault and sexual assault with a weapon. There were tears and hugs after the judge gave a sentence. One of the boys said, I'm sorry to the victims and their families, and I regret my actions. The ruling is 33 pages long. The judge didn't read it in court, saying it would take too long, and he didn't want to be misquoted. It mentions bullying and hazing being part of the culture at the private all-boys school, though these incidents went further. Two locker room assaults in 2018. Members of the football team using a broomstick to sexually assault one victim in October, a different victim the next month. Video of one incident was sent to other students. All three offenders were 15 at the time and were expelled from the school. A very fair and just decision. I think that he, he should be commended for his work on this case. Some of the probation terms include no contact with their co-accused, with exceptions, including if they're playing each other in football, counseling, with treatment addressing sexual boundaries, consent, as well as social media, sexting, and child pornography. They can't have any weapons for five years and have to submit their DNA. To give them a period of jail would in essence be harming society as a whole because you would be robbing them of their growth into society. This former student left St. Mike's in 2013 after being bullied. He's disappointed with the sentence. It sends a message uh, not only to the kids, but uh, to other people who are doing uh, these crimes that they can get away with it, you know, with the, with the right lawyers and uh, right people behind them. In his ruling, the judge also suggested the boys have paid through the media. To get into the courthouse, their families have had to run a gauntlet of media vans, in spite of the fact that we actually have other serious charges to deal with in this building. The media has decided this is the case that requires society's focus. That fact has added to the shame the boys are feeling. One more boy still has charges outstanding connected to these assaults. He's pleading not guilty and is set to go to trial next March. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. This, ladies and gentlemen, appears as though a human being was hunting another human being. Jeremy Urbina was just taking out the garbage when he was shot and killed by strangers. Urbina was gunned down last Wednesday night outside his Leslie and Finch area home. A homicide detective saying today it's the most callous murder he's seen in his 16 years with the unit. Angelina King joins us live now from Toronto Police Headquarters. And Angelina, police have released security camera images of the suspects. Yes, they have, and they're pretty confident that whoever knows one of the suspects will be able to recognize him from those photos. And today we're learning more about the horrific way Jeremy Urbina was killed. Police say that he was shot outside of his own home while he was taking out the garbage. They say minutes before, the two suspects were prowling around the building looking to possibly shoot anybody they came across. This was nothing short of being callous, cowardly and evil incarnate. The day after family and friends laid Jeremy Urbina to rest, Toronto police outlined the chilling details of his murder. Mr. Urbina did not see this coming. Police say Urbina was shot from behind at least 10 times. I've probably seen everything that human beings can do to each other, but I've never seen someone actually appear to look around to actually hunt down another human being. And I will use that term because that's how it presents. That's exactly what it looks like in my eyes. Detective Sergeant Terry Brown calls it an opportunistic crime, saying it appears the suspects were looking for someone, possibly anyone, to kill, and that it's highly unlikely they knew Urbina. This is one of the most callous killings I've ever witnessed in this office, 
and the fact that they were skulking around that neighborhood for up to six minutes for unknown reasons is, is most disturbing, but the fact that they're still out there is very, very concerning. In an effort to find them, police released these photos today taken in the complex's laundry room, hoping someone will recognize the suspect in the mask. It would be surprising for me if someone is not able to identify the person. Urbina was only 22 years old in his second year at OCAD University. An online fundraiser describes him as a hardworking, loyal and loving son, brother and friend, a young man who did nothing but care for others and had a unique way of putting a smile on everyone's face. A full life ahead of him, studying interactive media studies at OCAD, loved by all, and just happened to be throwing his garbage out at that time, at that moment. Police say while only one of the suspects fired a gun, they are looking for both people who they describe as young. They're also asking anybody who might have dash cam video from the area of Leslie and Finch on that evening, December 11th, to contact them. And Dwight, this is Toronto's 67th homicide this year. Yeah, just an awful case there. Thank you, Angelina. I'm living in an area that like has a lot of gun violence already, but like yeah, it affects me because you don't know if you're gonna walk down the street and then somebody just has a drive by and then shoots you. Their community saw ten shootings in just two weeks. So to combat gun violence, they're getting people to open up to each other over a meal. We'll have that story for you a little later in the show. Help may be on the way for thousands of families struggling to pay their rent. The Ford government is joining forces tonight with the federal government on a major funding injection for housing subsidies. City Hall reporter Lauren Pelly joins us live now with more. And Lauren, this sounds like welcome news for Toronto. There's definitely hope that these subsidies could help many low-income people in this city, people who are struggling with high prices, as well as the very lengthy wait list for social housing. But while this announcement was met with praise today, others say this is just a Band-Aid fix. And I can tell you that I would never have been able to attend university had it not been for that uh, subsidized apartment unit 100 meters north of here. At today's announcement in Regent Park, Cabinet Minister Ahmed Hussain said his story is a common one. Far too many of our citizens are struggling to find a safe and affordable place to live. Now the federal and provincial governments are teaming up to help. A new $1.4 billion partnership marks the first joint investment in the Canada housing benefit. We expect this benefit to support more than 300,000 households across the country. The federal subsidy program for low-income renters was first announced two years ago. The cash payouts will help eligible households afford a community housing unit or a market rental, offering people flexibility on where they want to live. How much families will get depends on their income and each city's average market rent. That means payouts will change in different cities across the province. But on average, provincial officials say it'll be around $575 each month and likely more in pricey Toronto. It's going to help them find housing that meets their needs and their budget. Housing Minister Steve Clark says the province will be targeting Ontario's most vulnerable residents. Survivors of domestic violence human trafficking, persons experiencing or at risk of being homeless, seniors, Indigenous people, and those with disabilities. It's actually like underfunding of a very important social service. This longtime social housing resident warns the program doesn't address the root causes of poverty. I feel that uh, that cash could be better used to actually build housing uh, for those living in our community that are now living in shelters that desperately need a place to live. Government officials say that's happening too. This uh, housing benefit is a, is a pillar of our national housing strategy. We're investing $2 billion through this initiative to help Canadians from coast to coast to coast address their housing affordability challenges. This will be cost back. This money is expected to start flowing to cities in the new year. So how much will Toronto be getting? Well, the province hasn't said just yet, but Housing Minister Steve Clark did say it will be a sizable chunk of the pie. Dwight? Lauren Pelly live on the rooftop for us tonight. Thank you, Lauren. Hello, my name is Kasha. Hi, my name is Nicole Waldron. Mr. Mayor, how would you assess the effectiveness of Vision Zero? I live in Scarborough and I have a housing question for the mayor. 
you wanted to know, so we asked. Your questions and more from Mayor John Tory as the city looks forward to 2020 and back at 2019. That's coming up at 6.30. Our fair city looking like it is in a snow globe from the shot this afternoon. Thick snowflakes falling near the island airport, caught by our harbor cam. And that snow, it was so fluffy and nice, you almost didn't want to step on it out there today, call it. Yes, it caused some havoc for sure, but beautiful, beautiful as it was falling in the downtown core, that's certainly for sure. I want to show you the radar imagery from that burst. It wasn't a terribly strong system, but just kind of moving through, meeting that Arctic air and a little more moisture at the surface than anticipated, and you get that snow, that fluffy snow that we were seeing. So this is not current. This is from just after the lunch hour going towards 4 p.m., and it very quickly, well, not quickly enough for those of you on the 400, but it did diminish and, and press eastward. All right, the temperature this morning, minus 16.5. Our average low, minus 7.3, the record. Okay, this has been holding since 1942. It's been around a long time, but this number that we had, well, that's the coldest it's been December. It's the coldest, in fact, it's been since last February. So we definitely felt the chill. It's around for another night. These are the current temperatures. Then we can factor in the winds, and this is what it feels like. So about minus 14 in Toronto at the moment. As for where we're going, the winds are going to change direction. So Niagara region, you could get a little bit of lake effect snow there through the overnight. And then into the morning rush, there may be a few spots here to the west that could see some slick roads and some visibility reduction but it will be short-lived. Then we get into sunshine and a clearing trend, so it's actually going to be quite a pretty day once we get going, not because of fluffy snowflakes, but because of sunshine. Minus 11, though, tonight, minus 5, so we're picking it up a little bit in temperatures-wise uh, tomorrow afternoon, Dwight, but we're really going to see those temperatures changing over as we go towards the weekend. I've got all of that, plus a look at Christmas coming up. The Thanks, forecast Carla. for Christmas. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. All 19 charges against Joshua Boyle, the Canadian held hostage in Afghanistan, along with his now estranged wife, were dismissed today. Caitlin Coleman claimed Boyle sexually assaulted and confined her after they returned to Canada. As Judy Trin explains, the judge said while he couldn't believe Boyle's version of events, he couldn't accept Coleman's accounts either. <laughs> Joshua Boyle tried to avoid the cameras despite being acquitted of a long list of charges, but his lawyer spoke for him. The judge gave a very thorough and, and lengthy decision, uh, spent over three hours delivering that decision, uh, where at the end of the day he made very clear he, he considered all of the evidence uh, and uh, concluded that none of the 19 charges against uh, Mr. Boyle had been uh, proven beyond a reasonable doubt. The couple moved to Ottawa after they were released from five years in captivity. In a previous Fifth Estate interview, Caitlin Coleman said Boyle treated her like a prisoner in their apartment. Life didn't change much. Um, after we were released. Josh continued to sort of control every element of my life. Um, he also started, like, I think he started taking on the role of the prison guard. Coleman testified that she was forced to abide by a list of rules, that Boyle forced sex on her and hit her. But the judge said her testimony was unreliable because Coleman also admitted to memory lapses. I've had a chance to speak with uh, Ms. Coleman. She's uh, devastated uh, by the verdict. I think the case is an example of the challenges that a complainant faces uh, coming forward with allegations of sexual assault or domestic violence in terms of how things operate in our criminal justice system. Um, and she needs some time to process uh, what was uh, said today and try and move on with her life. The judge also found Boyle not credible, but said the Crown had not provided enough evidence to make its case. Now that these charges have been dismissed, Boyle plans to engage in another custody battle. This is the first step to, uh, towards uh, Josh's ultimate goal, which was to uh, uh, have access and custody uh, of his children. Uh, I, I don't, perhaps I don't need to point out the fact that he's never seen his fourth child, ever. And he hasn't seen his other three children in almost two years. The Crown could appeal this ruling, but for now, the legal battle moves to family court. Caitlin Coleman has temporary sole custody of the couple's four children and lives with them in the United States. Judy Trin, CBC News, Ottawa. 
After Donald Trump's impeachment following a historic vote by the House of Representatives last night, the next step is supposed to be a trial in the Senate. But House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says she may not send the charges over to the upper chamber of Congress, Congress rather, right away. Megan Fitzpatrick now with more from Washington. The yeas are 229, the nays are 198. Now that Donald Trump has become the third president in U.S. history to be impeached by the House of Representatives, uh, the, the Senate has to decide whether he keeps his job. So forth, the Senate purposes. is tasked with holding a trial, but when that might happen is up in the air. The House has to officially send the two articles of impeachment to the Senate, and that hasn't happened yet. Speaker Nancy Pelosi said today that the next step is to see what the Senate decides about the format of the trial. The length of it and who may be called as witnesses are among the things that need to be decided. And it's not clear when those decisions will be made. While Pelosi didn't commit to sending along the articles of impeachment anytime soon, she did express satisfaction that her party forced Trump into the history books. Seems like people have a spring in their steps because the president was held accountable for his reckless behavior. No one is above the law, and the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. The Republican leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, gave a lengthy speech this morning defending Trump and saying his impeachment by the House sets a new toxic precedent. He also accused Pelosi and her party of getting cold feet because she didn't immediately send the case to his chamber. Democrats' own actions concede that their allegations are unproven. While the bickering between the two parties in the two chambers carried on, Trump was at the White House weighing in on his impeachment. He wrote on Twitter throughout the morning calling it a hoax and a witch hunt. Then he welcomed Jeff Van Drew to the Oval Office, a Democrat member of the House who last night voted against impeaching the president. Van Drew had signaled last weekend that he intended to switch parties and he followed through on that today. Trump welcomed Van Drew to the party and then shared his thoughts on impeachment. They cheapened the word impeachment. Uh, that should never again happen to another president. And I think you'll see some very interesting things happen over the coming few days and weeks. The White House has said it's confident Trump will be exonerated whenever a trial is held in the Senate and that it's ready to defend the president. Megan Fitzpatrick, CBC News, Washington. It's opening night for Star Wars Rise of Skywalker. I'm Greg Ross, live at Scotiabank Theatre, where thousands of hardcore Star Wars fans are gathering to be the first to see it. We'll talk to some of the most serious Star Wars fans right after this. The weather update is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train.
It is a really big night for Star Wars fans. The latest episode of the popular saga officially opens tonight. And that means fans are flocking to theaters to be among the first to see Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker. Greg Ross joins us live now from Scotiabank Theater. And Greg, fans have been there prepping all day, getting ready for this big premiere. Yeah, and there's such a huge crowd of fans pouring in here. Just to put this into perspective for you, Dwight, there are 14 auditoriums here at Scotiabank Theatre. They have Star Wars Rise of Skywalker playing in nine of them. They've had to cancel some of their other shows tonight to accommodate just the huge uh, throngs of people that are coming to see this premiere tonight. Everybody wants to see it on opening night and lots of people coming wearing their Star Wars costumes. Uh, this is a tradition for many people, but I found one of the uh, most incredible Star Wars families ever. This guy, he's not a part of it. He's like an adopted son meme. Yeah, yeah, I'm just uh, a member in of the Wars family. Yeah. yeah, but look at this. We've got, uh, well, we've got Kylo Ren. That's a pretty good costume. He wouldn't put the helmet on because he says he can't hear anything in the helmet, but uh, he's got his lightsaber. We've got mom, who is Princess Leia, dad, who is the emperor, and uh, we've got, uh, and you are Ray, of course. Uh, yeah, so we've got uh, the whole family decked out. But dad, you're really the catalyst behind all of this. You're the one who is the glue that keeps this Star Wars family together. <laughs> Yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and he's going to do his uh, emperor voice as well. But you remember seeing the original movie back in 1977 in the theater when you were a young kid. Yeah, it's actually been a big family thing for, for me all my whole life. I saw it with my parents originally. And then Empire Strikes Back was actually with my grandparents, took me to see it. And actually, every one of these movies now, we come and see it on opening night. But then over the Christmas break, we now take my parents to go see it with the whole family again. Incredible tradition and a self-proclaimed Star Wars nerd over here and uh, he's got his whole family involved. It's great. Hey, Dwight, you want to pay an extra 50 bucks? They'll give you this R2-D2. It's got a drink holder in the top ah. and in the back, you can put your popcorn in there. That's where people are storing their popcorn. But as you said, this is something that people have been preparing for all day. I had a chance to meet with some of the people who were going through their preparations, getting ready to see this movie tonight. For many Star Wars fans, it was a day-long celebration. I mean, this is a pretty elaborate costume. Thank you. Before heading to tonight's premiere, Stephanie Codsey stopped by the Star Wars fan experience on Queen West, decked out in a near-perfect Ray costume, along with her dog, Nipsey, who had a costume of his own. Is Chewie going to join you at the premiere tonight? I don't think Chewie's allowed. You know, they don't bring animals. He's a, a personal support Wookiee. <laughs> Right? Oh, here he goes. Look, see? <laughs> Just down the street at the Scotiabank Theatre, hundreds of hardcore fans prepared for tonight's premiere by watching each of the first eight Star Wars movies. This 24-hour marathon started at 7 o'clock last night. Are you crazy? Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Definitely. I've waited 42 years for this. Let's do it. This father and daughter had a long drive from a city far, far away. We drove from Ottawa. Uh, I brought Mackenzie to her first Star Wars um, movie when we went to see The Force Awakens. And we've been going to see Star Wars ever since together. Most were dressed from head to toe in their favorite Star Wars clothes. You've got the uh, Chewbacca jacket here. It's kind of keep it furry. I got my pin for the, uh, the premiere night last night. And yeah. uh, I'm even the pants and the socks and the shoes. Others dressed for comfort. The only guy that really is has been practical in this group is this gentleman right yeah. here <laughs> because you came prepared yeah. to spend the night. Oh yeah, you know, you're gonna spend like 24 hours in a theater, I'm gonna be as most comfortable as I can be, you know? So I was like, I gotta bring my house coat, wear PJs. Aren't you guys glad he doesn't sleep in his boxers? <laughs> he wasn't the only one who caught a little shut eye during the marathon. Kind of picked their least favorite movie to sleep during. Yes. So there was like Revenge of the Sleep, episode three. <laughs> there was a lot of sleeping people. So we're trying to, we're trying to work it out so we're all awake for, people for snoring in there. Yeah, What's yeah, happening? Yeah, yeah. People yeah. snore and then they wake it. themselves up by snoring. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. 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 That's but, the best part when they wake themselves up and they realize they're in a theater of yeah. 300 people <laughs> and they're like, oh. But. Those people are now watching the movie as we speak. They got a five o'clock screening. They've staggered shows throughout the night. Uh, most of them are sold out, but there still are some tickets available to come here and watch the official opening of this movie tonight, Dwight, here at Scotiabank Theatre. We've got a few fans here in the newsroom. You might see them up there. Thank you, Greg. <laughs>
Uh, I've been here since uh, Wednesday the 5th, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And how, how many hours was that? Um, around 168, because I have to leave the shower also. <laughs> That's 20 years ago when The Phantom Menace first came out, as you can see. Today's Star Wars craze isn't a new thing for the franchise. Fans have been dressing up and lining up for decades to see the films on opening night. And it's not just when a new movie comes out, it's for anything Star Wars related, including in 1999 when new merchandise came out. Over the years, we've spoken to a lot of Star Wars fans. Beautiful. And you know, it smells new. You can like smell the ink, smell it. Toronto's been pulled together by this. I mean, look at all these people in the line. I mean, they're not swearing at each other like, like you see people doing in the streets all the time. They're not snapping each other. They're being social. They're coming together to enjoy a rite of spring, the Star Wars movie. You know, being a part of Star Wars is, is uh, a little all-consuming. I'm supposed to be a dark Jedi. Those are like, you know, Jedi that used to be on the good side. But then after they got lured into the dark side, and then they turn into dark Jedi. This is the moment. This is the first Toronto screening, and we're here for it. I mean, it's the premiere. I had to bring it. <laughs> Chewbacca and I got BB-8 on top. They sure are enjoying themselves, whether it's 1999 or 2015 or even tonight. One thing is for sure, the Force is definitely with Star Wars fans. So ahead, we sit down with Mayor John Tory for a look back at 2019 and what 2020 has in store for our city. Plus, a major bus dismantles a sports gambling ring connected to the Hells Angels. These sport books are alleged to have brought in approximately $13 million in illicit funds. Police are linking the murder of a Hells Angels member outside a Mississauga gym last year to a ring of illegal gambling websites. More on that story after the break.
Some good news if you're one of the millions of Canadians dealing with those relentless and annoying scam phone calls. Starting today, telecom companies are required to help block scammers from calling customers. Thomas Degla has the details. Can you first of all stop crying? It's the scam that just won't go away and that Canadians have been capturing and sharing online. A fraudster delivers supposedly serious news and demands payment or else. There's no answer to the problem yet, but this could be step one. A CRTC regulation now coming into effect requiring telecom companies to block numbers like this. Blatantly fake and impossible to call back. This is a very complicated system where we want to make sure that uh, those vast majority of legitimate calls uh, don't get blocked. Bell and Rogers both say they're implementing universal call blocking technology, while TELUS says it's found a better solution known as call filtering for its cell phones. What it won't fix is fake caller ID from real numbers such as this one from the Canada Revenue Agency. A solution to fight that is expected next fall. The Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre says phone scams built users out of more than $24 million in 2019, and this initial measure is a good step. It will have an impact on some of the fraud operations out there, um, but how much will remain to be seen. Anne Murphy took an aggressive approach. Fed up with the fraudsters, she told one, the jig is up knowing Indian police recently arrested dozens running a scam call center targeting Canadians. I said, you're going to be shut down. And he said, that doesn't matter. He said, we'll lay low for a couple of months and we'll just start up again. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. It could just be the scam that won't go away. Indeed. That's tax scammers for you. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Provincial police have arrested 28 people in connection with an illegal gambling ring. It involves five illegal sports betting sites and has ties to the Hells Angels biker gang. Philip Lee Shannock has the details. All this real-world cash gained from a virtual criminal enterprise. Police say in six months, five gaming websites brought in $13 million for the Hells Angels. So much money that it became worth fighting over. And that this group of people were uh, were involved in uh, sportsbook betting, and then they, they were involved in a turf war with a rival faction for control of that sportsbook. In March, a known member of the Hell's Angels connected with the operation was murdered as he left a gym in Peel Region. This is one of the websites run by the Hell's Angels, but there are many that look very similar. And if they offer betting on the outcome of a single sporting event in Canada, they are also illegal. Police were led to the websites after an investigation into a gaming house in Mississauga. They say lower odds of stiff penalties can be attractive to criminals. They're viewed as sort of, I think, I believe soft crimes and, um, and certainly not uh, the, the consequences that they face versus, say, drug trafficking um, is, is significantly less. This expert in sports marketing says Canada should look into legalizing sports wagering. Okay, so when you have this type of activity underground, then it, it festers and, and it leads to this type of uh, outward criminal activity uh, on the surface. So uh, perhaps to stamp out this type of activity, you know, we should be talking about legalization of sports wagering. Police say over five years, criminals made more than $131 million and they amassed an arsenal to protect it. They also seized seven homes, two vacation properties worth more than $8 million, luxury cars, Harley-Davidson motorcycles, and millions of dollars in cash, gold, and silver, all tax-free. Philip Lee Shannock, CBC News, Toronto. At City Hall, it was a year marked by sweeping changes to Toronto's transit plans, months of tension with the province, and capped off with a major tax hike. City Hall reporter Lauren Pelly sat down with Mayor John Tory to look back at 2019. You've had quite a busy year. What would you say out of all of that has been your biggest accomplishment this year? First of all, I think we had to sort of fight the province and uh, that's not something I like to do, but I was pre quite prepared to stand up for Toronto and say, look, if you're trying to impose these cuts, it's just wrong. And I think we did fairly well out of all that. And that was really important. 
I think that led to uh, an ability to sit at the table and they would will be willing to sit with us and us with them to negotiate a transit agreement. So I think that came out of you know, saying, well, you could fight or you can talk. Uh, and then I think we came up with a housing plan. I mean, and so we've, we, we've, we've had these solid plans that came forward for housing and transit out of all of that. And then the question was left, well, how do you pay for it? And I just felt that it was time to sort of answer that question. I mean, well, looking at the, the tax hike, you know, people on the right are saying, wow, it, you know, it was really hard for them to vote in favor of this. And then people on the left are saying, you need billions more. This which says go to me, I've enough. ended up in the perfect place. I'm out meeting more people than probably almost anybody else in the city on a daily basis. And you can tell, if they're unhappy with you, they will both tell you about it or just even the way they approach you. When we had this interview last year, you told us that Vision Zero wasn't working. Correct. We've had another year of dozens of pedestrian deaths on the streets. Um, you know, a lot of people are still frustrated with progress on things like bike lanes. Do you think it's working now or are we still not on the right track when it comes to Vision Zero? We're making progress and I think the place that I'm, I'm heartened a little bit uh, and, and it's not good enough and I'm not satisfied with it, but if you look at the number of serious injuries this year, down dramatically. I have one more question for Vision Zero that came to us from uh, one of our viewers. So we can just watch that really quick and you can share your response to this. My name is Kasha and I am a member and co-founder of Friends and Families for Safe Streets. Mr. Mayor, how would you assess the effectiveness of Vision Zero since its rollout in 2016, and specifically your role and the role of council members? I would say that uh, we're beginning to make solid progress, and I think that is because the critical mass of what we've done with the senior zones, with the speed limit changes, with the school zones, with the photo radar, with the uh, red light cameras, with the road redesign, uh, is starting to have an effect because the critical mass of what we've done is starting to make a fundamental difference, but it has taken time. There seems to be this growing realization that, you know, you can't just keep adding bed after bed. You need those wraparound services and supports, supportive housing, things like that. You know, looking forward, how much more can council do on that front to build in those supports? Because there's been a bit of headway, even recent votes, you know, going in that direction. But what do you want to see happening next year and the year after? to make sure that people are actually getting out of the shelter system. These goals that we have to put in place, for example, supportive housing, we've said we need 1,800 units a year, which we do. And I can now go to the other governments, as I have successfully done, it took a while, but it's, I successfully did on Toronto Community Housing Funding and on Transit Funding. We, had, we have billions of dollars in hand today we did not have when I became mayor. We didn't have any of it. And so I will go to them and say, look, this supportive housing is needed to protect the success of the city, which is important to this whole country. We also have another question from one of our viewers. Hi, my name is Nicole Waldron. I live in Scarborough and I have a housing question for the mayor. Mayor Tory, we're in a housing crisis and we're looking at so many different models of affordable housing. One of the models that we know that started 50 years ago works really well is co-op housing. So wondering if you would support the development of more co-op housing in Toronto. As I said, co-op housing works. So I would just say that one of the encouraging uh, you know, things that was included in the national housing strategy when it was rolled out a couple of years ago was a commitment spoken by the Prime Minister that day a couple of years ago that they would uh, resume funding uh, for the cooperative movement, if I can call it that. And so I'm awaiting uh, that just because I think it does work. Where are those relationships at right now, and specifically the province giving such a tumultuous year with Premier Ford again? I'd say two things about the provincial relationship. First of all, um, I think that uh, time has passed. That government's been there for a while now. I think the Premier has started to f sort of, you know, better understand the nature of that job uh, and, and the, the, the sort of approach you bring to it. Uh, and I would say that they also know with us that if they're going to, you know, do things that we believe to be directly contrary to the interests of the City of Toronto and in fact are going to not protect the success that is Toronto today, first of all, I think they understand that's bad for the province. Th this city and its success, which is, is, is uh, undoubted at the moment, is hugely important to the success of Ontario. We are the economic engine of Ontario and all of Canada. I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, we know it's cold, but Colette's back with some good news for the weather this weekend. Also, what Christmas could have in store. We'll be right back. To take us a break, here's Mayor Tory singing a Christmas classic, sort of. Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer had a very shiny nose, and if you ever saw him, you would really say it glows, and so on and so on. My singing will scare off okay, the audience.
call it, you know, when you're a kid and you try to catch the snowflakes in your mouth? Mm -hmm. That was the kind of snowfall we had today. It was very pretty out there. Yes, and uh, I've done that as an adult, too. It's, <laughs> it's as much fun, I have to tell you. I know it wasn't fun today, though, for some of our roadways impacted by that snowfall. But, of course, in the areas where you were able to just walk around, boy, it was beautiful. Things are going to be changing, though. We're not going to be holding on to that snow because of our temperatures going in the other direction. Not quite yet, though. And there are a few spots that could still get a little bit of lake effect. So I'm going to show you where in just a moment here. Another chilly day, although it gets a bit better. And then the mild air moves in. And I want to tell you, you never count out the month of December because even just last year, the warmest day we had in the entire month came at the end of the month. In 2018, it was on the 28th, we went to over 12 degrees. So I'm not saying we're going there, but you never know what can happen. I'll show you where we're going to be going in the next seven days. Temperatures right now still cold, especially Barry and Peterborough, minus 11, minus 12, minus 7 in the city. Feeling like minus 14 when we bring those winds in. And speaking of those winds, yeah, you could see they're not posing a big problem in terms of lake effect at the moment. But what happens is they'll be changing direction. And as they kind of come around, like this and are coming more towards the east or from the east, it means that we're going to be seeing a little bit of lake effect through the overnight around the Niagara region and then that risk of seeing that pushing from the Niagara region around towards Burlington, Hamilton, uh, even Mississauga perhaps in the morning hours. Very short-lived. There shouldn't be much of it, but some flurries or maybe at times a little bit of a burst. The winds aren't terribly strong, so I think we're going to be kind of okay there. Into the afternoon, we get into sunshine and then Saturday, we will see some clouds rolling in because of the warm front. That's the front that's going to push our temperatures up. So just have to get there. Tonight, it looks like this, that wind chill feeling like minus 18, feeling like minus 10 tomorrow afternoon, but obviously the temperatures are better than that. Four to five, minus four to minus five, very important. It'll be great to see some sunshine out there, though. And just have a look at what happens. First day of winter, one degree on Saturday. Sunday, first full day of winter, and it's going to be four, Monday, five, and sunshine dry through the period. We're not talking about snow, maybe some flurries on Christmas Day, and Dwight, a high temperature of two degrees. Above seasonal. That week looks like a nice Christmas present for Toronto. Thank you, Colette. <laughs> yes, I would agree with you on that one. With a pity pity sauce as, as usual. Gotta get the sauce. Is what makes us what we are. Yeah, yeah, gotta get the sauce. It's one of the go-to shops for holiday food shopping. Shrestas shows us his St. Lawrence Market must eats after the break.
A Toronto community held a get-together yesterday centered around food and music, but this had nothing to do with the holidays. Instead, it was the latest effort by some high school students to try to combat gun violence in their neighborhood by getting people to open up to each other over a meal. Nali Nanowski was there. Please put the Angelica Sutton writes poetry about gun violence and mental health. I had a shooting that happened right beside my house. And she's not the only one. I'm living in an area that like has a lot of gun violence already. But like, yeah, it affects me because you don't know if you're going to walk down the street and then somebody just has a drive by and then shoots you. That's not a fear most people have in this city, but in Weston. Within the last week of October and in the first week of November, there were 10 shootings in this community. Including one where shooters entered an apartment building, sending five teens to hospital. The youth in the area wanted to speak out through tonight's performance. They prepared for months, holding dialogue sessions to talk about their realities. They came up with this project in which they would be having conversations around uh, violence in their community while eating a, a meal. They even made those meals together, putting the recipes into a cookbook, each one highlighting a tough topic. My favorite is the one, don't jerk me around, and that they did a jerk chicken. There was another one which was talking about uh, black eyed peas, and it was talking about, you know, women, the cycle of violence and getting that black eye, which is a sign of violence. Because there are gun people's lives have nightmares. Peace is the key, but we can't make peace if we don't work together. The hope is that those who commit the crimes listen to this team's approach and sit down for a meal and a discussion. Natalie Nanowski, CBC News, Toronto. If you're heading to St. Lawrence Market to grab some grub for the holidays, you may get the munchies. Need some recommendations? Bet your morning food guide, Suresh Dosh, shows us his favorites. Take a look. Mm. Really good. So there are a number of things you should get at Churrasco St. Lawrence. Um, one of my favorite things to do is to get the Piri Piri chicken, the whole barbecue chicken or the half barbecue chicken. And you gotta get that Piri Piri sauce. With the Piri Piri sauce as, as usual? Gotta get the sauce. Is what makes us what we are. Yeah. And my name's Eugene, Eugene Antunas, and I've been here at the St. Lawrence Market for the last 30, going on 31 years. Our specialty is Portuguese style chicken, grilled with history, sandwiches. I feel like it's one of those things that's not as popular in the market, but it's one of the best things to eat. Chicken like literally just falls off the bone. Lesser known fact and a hot tip, if you're gonna go to Churrasco, you wanna get the pache, which is essentially the Portuguese tart. There are a lot of places that do pastéis in the city, but when you're in the St. Lawrence Market, you want to go to Churrasco because they have the best one. My name is Randall Simon. I'm the manager at Mike's Fish, uh, located at the St. Lawrence Market, main floor right at the south end. Because the oyster bar has become so ridiculously popular, I actually had to add more tables, especially on a Saturday, and you got to come here on a Saturday to see that it is packed. My name is Yanni Spheris. I'm the owner of Yanni's Kitchen. Uh, we're in the St. Lawrence Market on the lower level. Chicken Eatos homemade from start to finish. It's uh, in a pita with tomatoes, onions, lettuce, french fries, and uh, the chicken Edo on top. And then our homemade Greek sauce. If you stick around after the break, we'll make it worth your while. This holiday card is beyond the parody style. We talk with the family behind it next.
It was a holiday video only meant for their family, but it's racked up nearly 100,000 views in a couple of days. A Toronto family shot a remake of the Beastie Boys intergalactic music video 20 years after the original was released. We caught up with the family to talk about their creative idea and their newfound fame. <laughs> We were looking for a three-person theme, and I thought, like, what better iconic trio than Beastie Boys? And we do a postcard, like a themed postcard every year. We sent it out to family and friends, and we thought we'd make this video just as a little piece of bonus content. I love that music video since I was a kid, and I just, something about that music video like, always stood out to me as, like, a really amazing way uh, to just have so much creativity and then to kind of be able to do that with my kids this year was super fun. Well, I just up uploaded it to Facebook for just like my immediate family and friends to see. Someone who saw it like and I also work with said, oh you should put that on somewhere public. We did the whole thing really fast. Production with kids you have to move extremely quick. So we basically started at that bridge um, at City Place at Spadina in front and just walked a little bit on Front Street, went down to the path um, and then went to Union Station, hopped on the TTC up to Young and Dundas and then did the final shot in Young and Dundas Square. It wasn't as big of a production as people would have thought. My favorite part was I was in this rainbow room and the camera was going in a circle around us. We were making really cool poses and it was really, really fun. And I like it when people ask for their Lumiato bath. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's kind of like just been so positive. The ultimate goal is to just be able to make something that makes people feel good and especially at this time of year and then for also it to be something that's like shared with the kids. Like I'm actually so surprised and just flattered by the like overwhelmingly positive outpouring and a really amazing like collective feeling of just good vibes. She sent some really good vibes with those great kids. That was lovely. I enjoyed that. It's because they chose such a great song, that right? That too. Yeah. I've watched it quite a few times here in the newsroom. All right, so we've got a bit of a warm-up after today's snowstorm. Mm -hmm. Or snowfall, not a storm, sorry. Yes, we Fall. had that snowfall earlier mm -hmm. today. You're right, and we're going to see maybe a little bit of a burst of some flurries coming around the lake, west end of the lake overnight mm -hmm. tonight and early tomorrow. But then things are going to be improving in terms of sunshine coming out, so we'll see quite a bit tomorrow. And we'll also see the temperatures. It's going to be a little bit gradual in terms of the climb, and we certainly have uh, tonight to get through. Minus 11, feeling like minus 18. But tomorrow afternoon with that sun, minus 5, still feels like about minus 10. But it's after that. As we go into the weekend, Dwight, we're talking about winter arriving, and it's bringing in... One degree on Saturday, that's seasonal pretty much, and then up to four degrees as we go into Sunday, and there's not really any more snow. No, we right? need snow on Christmas Eve. We have to revisit that early next we'll week. Re we can revisit it. <laughs> that's it for us tonight. Mike Wise has you covered at 11. Have a great night, everybody.